Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery Programming Series for our current exhibition, Arts Beacon of Light, curated by Katie Monahan. Today, we are thrilled to present artist Richard Duart Brown. As a brief reminder, everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode, so please feel free to use that chat function to ask any questions, and we'll get to them at the Q&A portion of the hour. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation in the bandwidth. So if one of us fluctuates, stay tuned, we'll keep rolling. It'll be all right. Thanks for being here. All right. Welcome, Dwart. Well, glad to be here. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my art today and um, I'm excited to be here. So here we go. We'll just move that thing. Oh yeah. So so you're gonna get a little just push that play. This thing works. Yeah, sorry, the cursor is just that's just you're good. Okay, so just So that little intro is, is the way my life feels, like a bunch of colors moving fast. And it goes back to me as young Duarte talking about my whole life experience. I'm going to come up with the first piece called Jack and Jill. It's uh, influenced by my grandma, Amy. And um, when I first came to Ohio, I thought that if I win um, major art shows, that I would get recognition and I can just do gallery shows and I could then um, get rich and buy happiness and fix my family. So one of my, in a corner of my mind, we would live like the Brady Bunch. And I don't know how that was going to really happen, but somewhere in my mind, that's how making art was going to make our life come alive. And so this piece called Jack and Jill is put on burlap and sewed. And I started in 77. So um, you find it, um, filled, it was it was rolled up and put away. My brother Darnell, who I lived with when I first came to Ohio, uh, he was going to Columbus College of Art and Design. So I was a 13 year old that hung around him and began high school year. Um, but I kept the notion that winning an art show was gonna give me worldwide fame and recognition and then I could fix my family. So th there was this goal to, to find and fix family for me. And so Jack and Jill, the uh, reason why they, 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 they were meant to be European characters because when I noticed in the art shows, um, art that was done, it wasn't a lot of black art or art that had colored people in it or, or, or African-Americans. So those those terms and titles had, have changed since I was a beginning artist. It was like, you know, the black and proud people group. It was the African-American group. It was the colored group. And so color was always um, somewhere in the corner of my mind. And, and the fact that um, I didn't know who my father really was, I later found out. He was a white guy. And so um, I, I felt this draw to, to culture and race much more inwardly than you can see out, outwardly. But then I move on to some other stuff. What was great about coming to Ohio, I got the chance to, to live and hang around Smokey Brown, Grandpa Smokey Brown. Um, he uh, called himself Smokey Brown, but his real name was Russell Purse. In these slides first right here, you'll see Smokey, um, his wife Laverne, their son, um, and my daughter April and Ricky. They're in their 30s now. Um, Smokey would always meet up with people and make art that was like in the realm of dialogue. He was a, he was a um, person that, he, he had a second sight on people and he'd always would draw the second sight of a person. Like he would look at you in your presence, but he would see you like in, in picture mode. And if he saw you in picture mode, he drew you from a certain place. And he drew me in this piece that I had ever since. And it was always stuck somewhere in a corner around the house, but as he passed away, it became even more precious. Fast forward down the line, uh, a couple of years ago, his wife, Laverne, he died in 95. And his wife, Laverne, kind of fell off, got away from the art scene to me after his death. And so we hadn't, hadn't been in touch. So I get this email, with her under a maiden name, and it was actually Laverne. And she had, she, she, she knew she was was time for her 
to, 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 to go on to the next life. And she was trying to fall, find a small place, get rid of some things she had. She gave me some of Smokey's work. And that's how I heard this piece right here called his, his alter ego, Donnie. So it looks kind of like Smokey with both of his eyes open. And it's kind of like what you, it's, this is what you see right here. The issue of dad, or it's always been a, a strong um, force in, in my work. My work comes from your, my abundance. Like all of us, it's from our spirit level, I think, or our intu intuitions or our deepest thoughts. And I've always like been fascinated the idea of, of the idea of having a father. I remember being in school watching or being in places where kids would show up with a father that worked with them, you know, and the mother as well. But the father thing, I would see girls that had a father or boys that had a father. It seemed like they would, they would, they would have a different uh, or a good relationship with a father. It seemed like they had a grasp on life and a, a grasp in direction and a, and a piece about them. And I love seeing um, kids just playing, hanging and, and loving around their dad. But this piece right here kind of goes in the realm of me talking to a dad in like the afterlife, you know, telling him how life was or what I did without him or how I made it. But it, it's just one of those pieces that pulls the thing at me. And that's why Smokey seemed to play a, a major role in my life. Along the way, um, I found my wife in a church. And so um, everywhere I went, painting was natural for me to like articulate or navigate or make sense out of life. And I think what I noticed more about painting, when I painted, it seems like that was a reflection time or a time when answers would just literally come in my head. Um, in the church, one of the churches I attended after being in a church for like a 10 year span, I found a place where they did what they called worship painting or prophetic painting or painting um, like in the moment with the message or in concert with the message and the performances. And so um, I found myself doing that. And in this piece right here, you see this lion and lamb guy. That is a symbolic thing when I found out who my father was, my actual birth father. I found out when my younger brother passed away um, in, um, and I found out he was a white guy in Pleasantville that my mother sent me to when I was 12, but she had never told me who the guy was. And every time we got together, so let me just say my wife, my, my life was kind of like, <laughs> my mom was in and out of our lives in a way where we kind of were abandoned, but she was there. So it's kind of like one of those unchecked things where some kids get taken and put into foster care, some kids. So I, I was like the older of four younger siblings. So um, I was always concerned about how we were going to live and how and I navigated. So I didn't really play as a child. I didn't really have play inside of me. So painting was like, it was like an obsession to paint. That was the way I think I outletted, I played, or I made sense out of life. And so when I'm painting, it's like I'm talking to all the elements of my life. And so here you find me with my, the idea of who my father is, because I always felt like he was innocent of of uh, anything wrong. It was like we were going to meet in the afterlife and I was going to explain to him how my life was. And the, so you use this black lamb and this white lion to kind of symbol, symbolize my life. And, and these worship paintings were paintings that um, always had, in my mind, I would get a vision or a thought or a concept and paint it in the service. And sometimes what they would talk about or speak about would actually line up with the painting. And we were doing a tent revival in this painting on the right over on uh, the Linden area. And it was like this idea of, of uh, God touching all the people that were like left in abandoned places and giving him his glory or his presence. And, and I would meet people in the service or later that would come to me and tell me they saw that same image in a dream or in a vision. So some of those things um, would happen like that. And this kind of this work was kind of work I don't tell a lot of people about. It's, it's like you're going into a side of me that I've never talked about publicly because it just kind of had a special place for me. Let's see, where am I going? My cursor's not working. There it goes right here. All right, this is a continuation of that same thing. Well, um, this one picture on the right, it's uh, a, a, a guy that's in South Africa that I really love. He sings and me and Carol, the girl named Caroline, we did a service right right around a little bit after coming out of the beginning year of COVID. And it was, that's where it felt like we needed to really pull together and, and catch people that were falling off with the, with the trappings of COVID. Um, a little bit about me, I, I love color. Um, 
I love texture. I love movement. I love emotion. Um, you know, and um, sometimes it it takes a while for me to um, but I, paintings will transform. And when I start a painting in front of these people, they'll tell me while they're watching me they liked it when it was here. They liked it when it was there. And then they thought I was finished at certain places, but it keeps going sometimes. Sometimes it goes so far that I lose it and, and, and I almost have to <laughs> restart or put it aside. But um, this, this one on the right um, is, is, a, is an image that I saw years ago of, of, of us helping people reaching out and pulling people back in that were that fell off all kinds of circumstances. So it's like that. And in and, and, and doing this, I started working with a lot of younger kids who would draw pictures. And so these images on the right up in the corner where the bird is, is, these are drawings from the kids at the Central Community House. It's the after school program that I work with. And on the right, BHB was in the middle of a COVID. Um, we had our first open mic after being pulled away from everybody else. And he he was introducing everybody and he had his mask on and he was doing a dance move. And he he's, he works with me through Transit Arts as well. And you'll, these, the, all these um, figures overlap. They they may come from an area. So it's like, if I'm in a, talking about Smokey, he might've been a Transit Arts shortstop and everybody kind of like, it's like this big ball of yarn that unravels and it's rolling in and out of all these corners. And so it's connected, but you can't see where the string is actually coming from. It's like, sometimes it's crisscrossed, sometimes it's overlapped. Sometimes, have you ever seen yarn get really jangled and mangled and pulled apart and balled up? It's all still connected some kind of way. And that is way, the way my mind often feels and the way my life often is in some senses, but it makes sense to me. So if I am to explain to you, say I'm in a class today, I'm doing a workshop and I'm painting BHB. My head is thinking about what I'm gonna do next and where I'm going next. But if I tell you about it, it's like, I'll forget what I'm doing. But if I keep it in my head and go to it, I'm one of the kind of people that has to keep it in my head, go to it and I'll show you what I'm doing. But I lose a lot of what I'm trying to do when I try to talk about it. So I, I know that about myself and it's, it's caused a little, some problems with my wife, but we've navigated around and we begin to know things that we don't say, so, okay. All right, along with the um, worship painting experience, um, we were doing a, a tent revival on Main Street. To, it's a, you know, before school starts or after it ends with this place, World Fire. And so I was invited to paint outside on Main Street. And in this particular time, it was the same day Is said, he's a master poet in our city who just passed away, um, was getting his walk of fame with the, the Lincoln Theater. And um, this guy comes to me and tells me about his vision out there. He was watching me painting on the right, who is Is said's son, which I didn't know at the time. And he said he had a vision of, of a guy that was like, struggling and but um he talked about Aaron and Aaron how Aaron's brothers held his hands up or they held his hands up and I said stand up how you're telling me the vision so he stood up and I took a picture of him and the next day this picture was done and he came back and I found out he, he was his said son so it was such an honor to meet the son of a major um father of our city is said poet and and playwright and so it's it's just those are the kind of things I find myself into when I'm doing these kind of paintings this is another kid or young man <laughs> no longer with us, Ralph Bell. And what was cool about Ralph, um, he was a paraplegic who painted um, with the with the helmet apparatus. And I he had cerebral palsy, but they had locked him away in a mental institution. And I met him through Park Lawn Manor on the west side and a senior uh, care facility. And the guy behind him is Dean Campbell, who uh, I got to see when this show here opened at the right. Um, and it was kind of, a, we, had, we hadn't seen each other since Ralph passed away. And so these people are like um, major, major influences in my life. And one smart thing or cool thing or one honorable thing about working with Ralph Bell was uh, when my daughter came to, my daughter April came to visit and uh, I hadn't seen Ralph in a while. And so every time I saw him, I was like, um, I would smile. I would, I would just, just shake my head. Yeah, like, but he, he never really said words. He painted he looked at the paint and he looked at you and you looked back at him, but we never said words. So when I showed up this time without my daughter to come see him, he said, how is your daughter? And I looked at him like stunned because I didn't realize he had, you know, he had a set of language or he even talked, you know, because we, we just looked at each other and painted and we never said words. And so uh, I seen the power that kids have on adults and especially elders. 
at every stage. And, and I think that my daughter really moved her off because he was in the hospital. She just came with a simple childlike way, gave him a hug and a, and a kiss or, you know, like a, like a father or grandfather. And I think that really stuck with him. And, and when I talk about it now, it's hard not to tear up a little bit because I'm getting in those ages that Ralph was. Um, speaking of my daughter, this picture here, this is a, something I, was, I did for a group here called Urban Strings, a piece that they could take around and it's called Amina's Window. But on the side where you see the picture of Amina, me and my son, Ricky, that was taken by my daughter, April, looking at, at us when her work was brought at the main library. And um, and so I, um, I I I didn't I was I kept wondering where where did that picture come from and I'm, I'm reminded that April came with us that day and they had the if you've never heard of Tony West and the Monty dancers and the community it was a very big community event and um, those things really hold a special place in my like language and vocabulary but the very last time I got to see Amina she was at the Hammond Hawkins Gallery um, on Bexley in Bexley before it moved to the short north. And, and um, when I seen her, she's always asking, she called me Durat, and she'd always ask me, how's the family? And so um, I always had it in my mind not to ask her how, how, how her family was because her son, Sydney, um, you know, took his life and he was gone. But I knew that they had to, as a parent, you never, you never forget a child that was born or gone or part of your life. And I, I um, always had this desire to... Um, you know, I didn't know how to talk to her about, but so when when you see the picture on the left where Amina's window is out, if you look up in the corner, you'll notice Amina's hands on a boy, and that's me imagining her reunited with Sydney. So it's um, and it's some of her things she talked about, like she was in the Pointer Village, Pointester Village, and you know, documenting culture and doing our our canon of artists all around and keeping journals, and you know, having you just taking art boxes, and I think she just really and embedded the sense of family for me, uh, for a lot of us. So this is a very like cool thing. This is even before I got a chance to be a Amino fellow. So it's kind of like um, amazing that I get a chance to go in her house and, and honor who her son Sydney is. And, and for, for this, for this, I call it the Amina and Sydney fellowship. They created a whole fellowship where people, two people a year get to live in our house and make art. They get a writer to write about it. And it's a powerful thing that the community gets to still live with the works that Amina did for us to live far beyond her life on earth. And, and I think she really wanted to build a library and everything. <laughs> okay, and you, you see us you know, inside the house, visitors from Toledo and um, some local artists were making stuff right there in the table. Right here, you'll find a kid named Dante. Well, these, these people have become major forces in my life. But um, in this picture, uh, he's a kid here in Columbus. And my whole idea is pass the brush to the next generation. And you'll find uh, on the right, Mr. Steele was a fifth grade teacher for me. And I and this kid is supposed to meet me in a fifth grade or his representative of me in my fifth grade. And, and when Dr. King um, was shot and murdered, they announced that over in the classroom. So it's, and I watched Mr. Steele in front of us, you know, sloop in a the, in the, in the classroom and fall into tears. So he left this major, um, this idea of, of uh, passing the brush and, and compassion on me. He became another father type, type figure in my life. So it's um, this idea of community came through Mr. Steele. I feel like his influence is, is a major one for us. Again, back at Amina's house, or I got to see Ann Hamilton and, and Hanif sitting on her couch. They did a special thing with Columbus Monthly. And, and I had this idea of Amina sitting right there with him. So this piece is called Amina's Sofa. And had gave me a chance to meet Anne and Hanif through that experience. And you see Sydney's in the background there. Right here, you're coming into some of our transit arts experiences. Uh, Mimi Shemfield and Jackie Calderon are people that sh shaped me. This is a, if you ever go to the North Market, we have a few murals up on the second floor. Here's some of our teens, Bonte, Emmy, and Kat. And the Brothers Keepers are over here at the Riding house on Transit Road, tra Transit in Transit Arts, Transit Road, Transit Arts. It's funny to see all these kids. Time flies so fast. So, um, one of the kids, Andre, who is one of our Transit Arts men, who just got another job somewhere else, 
he's still hanging with us, but he he was sitting on the steps talking to one of our students. Uh, they, he called himself Little Boy Blue. And uh, it was such a beautiful picture to watch the way this mentoring role happened. And one of the kids in the car with me, we sometimes were picking up kids, taking them here and there before our classes, after classes, after dance classes. And Alvante looks at me and said, you're going to paint that, aren't you? The kids begin to know what, my, what really captures my mind. And um, during 2020, um, one of the kids that I, that I worked with named Chris Bradley had, he was murdered literally. And 12 years later, I met his son who, who's now a graduate of high school. He graduated in 2020. He stopped by Transit Arts because every year we give these graduates some little gifts and some kind of, you know, acknowledgement of them, you know, transferring into adulthood. And Jackie caught this picture of, of Christian, Christian's son grab, hugging me. It was one of the most tenderest pictures. It's kind of, every time I look at it, it's just so much love. You know, we have had a chance to experience working with the Transit Arts family. It's been a lot of relationships built. Um, and again, you see a lot of color coming into these pictures. Just love color. I think, I think the more intense life becomes for me or us or however, color seems to be like this, this thing that cries out and just begs to be a part of it. And color, I think when I see people, sometimes I see colors in them and around them, like just radiance. Uh, most of the, and that's why some of these colors have these radiant things coming off of them. And, um, and when I go back and then when I, some pieces I'll look at and I'll start and it'll be a year later, I'll come to it and I'll look at it and see it just needs this one more adjustment of color because I'm never quite satisfied. I always want to bring it to this, this strongest relational dance. The colors seem to have a relational dance for me and um, I'm triggered by that. And sometimes just a touch color, it seems like color touches a spot in all of us, especially me where it, it just remains, when I see people sometimes they're associated, I can see red all around them or, or blue or something. And I can't really say they fit into someone else's. A lot of people give you breakdown definitions of what colors mean, but um, they, they all, I think they all mean different things for all of us. Right here, this is a plethora of the community coming together for a piece that's at the Hilton. And you'll see people like Aaliyah singing and the drummer, uh, Cedric Easton, Trip Fontaine is a poet, spoken word, word artist, and Joey Hebdo is a musician. And I forgot the guy's name from the shadow box. So this is kind of like all these people coming together, creating this lively, vibrant Columbus community. Um, love the texture, love color. But this one was muted down for, uh, to me, it's muted down for a, a palette in a hotel somewhere. Instead of like, if, if, if I would go after, you see some more stronger, solid bolds in there. But um, I'm going up and down the scale of trying to make some of my paintings fit in different realms. But this was one that was done for uh, a hotel, but it, um, the Hilton. If you look on these paintings now, you'll notice that this little face is appearing in there with an Afro. That's me when I was 13. I began to put that in my work at one point. So young Duarte tells the story of who I am. So he's going to be, he's going to go in and out of every realm of my life. And he's going to keep a record of what I call the East Side Canon. That's a canon of artists that have come together and built us up. That I've, that I've found family in. You know, children become the subject of all my art for some reason. Um, I just love children. This is one of the first ones on the left, my left. It's where it's called Bread. And you see this guy with all these little figurines. One of the kids that I was painting with painted those, what two kids, I took their work and collaged it in the background. It was kind of new for me. Um, and on the right, you'll find this kid from after school program. He would show up. He was one of the one of the kids that got in trouble a lot, but he would come to the art room. And if you put paint in his hand, oh my God, he turned into an angelic being. He just sit there and would draw it. I'd have so many pictures of kids working like in such a peaceful place, you know, and, and it seems like they're always, they're always, he was sitting there with a runny nose, untied shoes, but he was drawn with such, such a, uh, a angelic uh, piece about him. And those kind of things happen. Actually, the red background was a canvas that one of the kids I paint with kind of actually threw away and, and where he just disregarded. So um, I kept that red and just put this whole image together and up in a, up in the top corner, you'll see these people hugging. That picture came to me after the LA riots. It's been like um, a desire to comfort humanity. 
So that's those images. So I'll talk to you a lot about images. Images, humanity, humans, they seem to be the, the thriving force behind my work. Um, this group of people are from all different areas like transit arts and schools. We did a mural on the South side with all people art. Gallery Felicia Dunson's there. She was a co, we both did this together. It's the first time she was a student of mine through shortstop and now she's an adult artist practicing in our city. And I just love watching the kids grow. And I think that's her niece down here in the middle. Uh, she's now a 10th grader, the age her mother was when I last saw her. So it's kind of crazy to watch these kids grow up. And ACPA is a part of my history. I was, was the beginning founder of that school with Gigi Howard. So all these people really, really mean a lot showing up at these different phases of my life. And here you, kinda, you find an opportunity to work with, uh, as that was going on, I was working with people in Bell Fountain, local arts. The Bell Fountain Art Commission is what it was formerly known as. And we were working on this process, project for the Mills Brothers. They're from Ohio. And the kids, the kids in Bell Fountain wanted to do equity and diversity and, and represent it in the public art. They found out they didn't have much of people of color on the walls or in the public art. And they, they learned about the Mills Brothers being from their town. And this was a project we were putting together ever since the outcry of uh, violence that happened over the last few years. This is the son or grandson of one of the Mills brothers that you've seen sitting out there with the yellow bandana and, um, and the murals in the back of this picture. You'll see him. Um, we're, we're doing a little booklet about that family and their connection to Ohio and how they were led here through um, looking for a safe place. Uh, and that's one of the grandsons. This is uh, my tie to Whitehall, Whitehall community. Um, Sarah Hebdo is one of the teachers I work with there. She does ceramics and 2D, 3D art. And uh, we, we start, she does these conferences with the Ohio Education Association. And so we've done these um, tile pieces. We started this, this was our first year doing it uh, with um, Lady Lisa Butler and Percy King. And they got these tiles that we put together as awards for being our speakers. and. Right, and it happened during COVID, so it was a special thing that's kind of picked up. She's kind of gave me the hunger, and I bit into the the love for clay and ceramics and learn some of the techniques, which requires patience and time. So that's where we start there. These are two students from um, Whitehall, Jaden and True, and I use them to kind of tell a history of a lot of this, where I use a lot of students just to speak about relationships and history and these colors. They're all kids from different eras like Anthony. And a lot of them are here from the Dante Pesta brush. They're, they're, so the history lesson is just like this, um, just telling the idea of who we were, where we come from and what we are and, and just holding them in the story. So they're part of the story. We're all part of the history of, a, of America. You see, again, I, I like to keep the kids involved in this work. They're from Whitehall. And this was the seven elders piece that was started during COVID. And then you see Jaden True, the real Jaden True behind Jaden True. I kind of love, I love keeping kids involved in this way. And these pieces were like born out of this idea of using gourds. And I, I love the way African art, when you see the faces, you can kind of see a whole story in one face. And I, and I was trying to simplify some of my work so you can see a whole story, like from this, the, this idea of uh, sometimes paintings will like freezing my mind when I'm driving down the street. And I remember seeing this arm touching this boy's head. And I was, uh, I was, I was looking at this idea of, 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 of anointing him with some kind of peace in the, in the midst of the, all the violence that was always recorded since I started working with, especially black boys. It was uh, murders all around me. It's a painting that's not in this, in this um, group, but um, it was always this idea that so many kids were murdered and, we try to find a way around that or find some peace in the midst of that. Here we move to some more kids from Whitehall and, uh, and other places. And Francesca shows up and we painted each other. She, she was, say she's afraid of color. And so she, she didn't know I was painting her one day when we came by the transit arts. And so um, I was playing with the idea of color. And then she came back with the piece she did on me. I'm really proud of what she did. And these are some other people from Whitehall that work with the kids. 
more color, more color. Got a chance to do this art pop sign for uh, the people that do the art pop banners. It was a special moment. What was really cool, they put it Southwest Hamilton Road, which people that was going to the Career Center could see it. People that was living in Whitehall could see it. And it actually goes back to the Lincoln Theater and it ties George Mueller, who had Black Arts Plus in our city. And Felicia's side view is in there with Dion Custer and um, Barbara Fink, as far as these people you can see, they're way in there. So it was always like keeping this history of whoever built each other up and became part of my family. It was like for me, and it is like for me, when I get around people and artists, they become my scrapbooks or history books. Or, and I think that um, entering a Black history contest as I was younger, I always liked the idea of they would cut pictures out of all these celebrities, all the people that were important or the people that meant anything. But then I started doing it for my own family because we didn't really have family books. You didn't, mom didn't tell me who dad was. Dad didn't introduce himself to me when I did actually meet him. And so it's kind of like, I was kind of left out of our own family history. So it gave me a hunger more for documenting just who I am and who I'm around and who, who's, who's part of us. And so finding family, it made me see family in everyone or you know, feel that sense of family. Uh, one of the kids from Transstars named Diego Pablo, he's a kid I met at Whitehall. He was in the car and he heard me emotionally talking about getting an inheritance of art from Smokey Brown and how I, I transformed from being a bastard, a fatherless boy that couldn't get an inheritance to, to a son with an inheritance. And that, it was done to the art community. And it was hard to talk about this without tears, without all the stuff. And I had called my nephews, called my son, I was calling people. And, and when we're riding home from Transit Arts, you know, you can talk on your phone, you know, through the, while you're driving without even using the phone. So it's so these conversations, these kids are in the car or my conversation sometimes. And you're dropping like six or seven kids in six or seven different areas. And Diego lived in my area. So he had this idea to surprise me for my birthday. <laughs> and um, he asked me, what did I mean? And I always talked about how, my father wasn't there, but this invisible God was there. So he, so this is going to get me a little emotional because he's, um, you see this boy with his hand up and I'm holding on to the hand of God, but he was holding on to me. And um, so Diego puts all these snapshots with Smokey there and other people from realms of my life. God, I thought I was over this tear stuff, but yeah, that, that one's there. Um, sorry, for you, but um, it's just a little bit there but um now we're going to um some of the pieces that have uh that are in the show um Pasha, uh streetlight came into my life and i got a chance to paint her doing her performances at streetlight uh it's a good it's a little art place here not a little it's a big space for me but it's a little place here that houses performance art visual art poetry spoken word art and scott wood is a guy that kind of had this dream with a few other people to come in there and create this space. I call it my ace gallery too. There was an ace gallery that had a little bit of, a lot of things back in the day where I first met Smokey Brown. Uh, and that's Pasha. She's one of the, she actually does ceramics as well. And some of her group is in this picture and you notice a little green door art down here in the corner. Uh, one cool thing, I kind of learn things after I'm in them. So in the middle of the way I painted, um, I started noticing the way I use color. And one day I was painting with a student Nehemiah, who built my website, and he uh, he painted a, a bear with, you know, gold, yellow, and purple, and he was showing me how they were pro opposite colors on a priming, uh, color wheel, complementary, and uh, even though I had seen that stuff, I never really paid attention to the color wheel, and um, I just wanted the colors that I felt to work, and then from working with Nehemiah, I always keep a color wheel around just to look at what colors are opposite when I'm painting, and so Patience picture, I, I decided to put a, a green Duarte down there because of the red on the round. So it was just playing off these color things. And um, recently, my family came from New Jersey and saw this show. We had a, a death in the family a couple of weeks ago. And so, you know, death always brings people together. And so they stopped in to see the show while they were from New Jersey. And they everybody assumes Mudfoot is Smokey Brown. But this is not Smokey Brown. This is a guy called Mudfoot. That's a real foot. That's a real character or person that Grew up around, you know, in Amina's time. She, he, he, I think that he was a football player for East High School. Something happened, and he became, he became, um, he he became codependent or something, and he he had a mental problem, 
And this picture is uh, inspired by a, night, a man named Derek Cole, who I got to meet. He's another artist in the city. And he uh, they climbed a mountain. And, and, and somehow he told me about the Mudfoot story. And I was, I was going to tie them together for this piece and how we stand on each other's shoulders by pulling all the ancestors or ideas of our ancestors into this piece. And so it's that Mudfoot was our, he, he's a shoulder we stand on. People that could be our weakest link or could be going through problems, we stand on our shoulders. They are, they're part of us. So it's this idea of building a community and standing on each other's shoulders. And it was, and so it's kind of like one of those pieces that I spent, like you, you know, you have this concept and you keep going into it with more layers and squares, but, uh, <laughs> So, but uh, Derek had no idea he was going to be in the painting for real, but it, it, so it's this idea of community and Mudfoot makes people think of Smokey Brown, but Smokey Brown always made people think of community. Oh, here you go, Kamal. So some of those, what we call live paintings are done like at, at uh, you know, Parsons Library or Transit Arts, we have open mics or we did something with um, Harmony Project, this art of healing painting on the right. And I, I purposefully do these paintings three foot by three foot. I call them three in one pieces. They're like the triune nature of father, son, and spirit, or you know, mom, sister, daughter. It's just this this number three idea of threes in one concept. So it's like intimate, it's revealed, it's personal, it's a lot of things going on. And so these these pictures are usually three foot by three foot. And those are my um my personal, those ones that I just, I just feel like they're always telling the story of a, of a lot more. And um, Kamal, I met him at the library. Um, some of the kids actually were there. We did a um, open mic there. And so this became the piece. And a few kids said, this is what I want for my birthday. I want you to paint me, paint my story. <laughs> they think it just happened so easy, but just a lot of research that goes into it before you start. And every time you meet someone serving a community, especially a man, for me, a black man, um, I think that I, I realized later when I was younger and we used to go when I was in, learned how to read the paper and look for jobs at four, well, before 14, you know, because I was trying to find a job at I, when I was 11 so I could help my mom take care of us. And I remember learning how to read the horoscope. And I also would listen to news and I heard a lot of people say, where is black leadership? Where are the black men? Where? And when Dr. King was killed, um, it became like a loud thing about where was black leadership? That's when I was in the fifth grade and Mr. Steele was my teacher then. So I think that I was purposefully, every time I painted, I was looking for a black leadership or men or men that were taking lead. So every time, um, I'm just telling you, this is the, the, the thing that I'm not always aware of till it comes down the road. And so Kamal was another one of those guys who, who does stuff in our city and he's, he's been focusing on, you know, uh, he has, he built a place on Parsons Avenue and he's always having these men that reach out to each other and he's, feeding the homeless. So there's a lot of these things that people just step in and do. And he's he's one of those guys that became like that. He he's uh the, the kids still go to the library. I think I think he's still at the library. Um and the art of healing. This is in reference to my sister Penny. So I kind of not kinda purposefully put the the group of people hugging that came after the LA riots. That was inspired after the LA riots. And it's this idea of these people, when, when, let me just back up. I think that I jumped, when the, the LA riots happened, it was devastating to watch on news after the Rodney King verdict, right? And so this is like, you know, something that you, I was on my way to work um, and, you know, people were busting out windows, beating up Reginald Denny because he was a white man driving through the neighborhood. And this lady, this black lady stops people from beating this man up. They, they, she walks in the middle of a crowd, beating up a guy up named Reginald Denny. He was because he was white and he was driving. And um, this, uh, this lady stops this in the middle of that crowd. And, and I, I, uh, I asked God on the way home from this place or to, to my job where I was at, how do I respond? And I just kept hearing come from my humanity. And that's where this human series of embrace came. And those pictures are always somehow they're in some of my works you'll find. This, these are more uh, pieces. This is a guy, Trip, Trip, you've seen him using another picture, reading poems, and these are kids from Whitehall. And he did a piece called Permission to Cry. This was during what they called the, um, they did a piece called the Harlem Renaissance area, uh, Harlem 100. They did this, this thing and he spoke at uh, one of the galleries and we hooked up and 
he gave me his poem and we made a collaboration. An another piece over here, this is a kid from Whitehall as well. And um, his brother had gotten murdered and I used him as someone that was gonna find a way out instead of like this idea when, if someone murders your family and you're a younger brother, it's, it's devastating. And then these kids are trying to fight an enemy they can't see. And some, 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 some suggestion of peace or balance or hope is, is really needed. So those things are like kind of forefront in some of my work. This piece is uh, When Rocks Cry Out. It's very personal. If you really get into it, it's very layered. Um, it's one of my favorite pieces in a sense of, I was able to, to put feelings in, into pieces. And I like, I like starting a piece of work that, that's not always on a canvas that I just start look, looking for whatever's in the studio, in the area, or in the boxes, or in the bins, kind of hold on to pieces over the years, like this cord, this phone cord was there. It's, a, it's actually a, a toy soldier in here wrapped around with a bunch of articles. So this kind of has elements from the church area, this idea of this guy in the water with the rocks crying out, the, this hand with me and a sword and a Bible in my hand, it's right here with my hand stop, stopping the you know, killing and hurting. Um, it's just so many things from a personal area. This is my sister Penny up there holding a black baby and a white baby, symbolizing, symbolizing our, our biracial family, the mez. Just so many people are wrapped up in here that I know personally. And some things, Smokey's words, it's it's just it's a lot in this piece, and it would take it would take more than an hour to really talk it out and break it down. So, but I, I'm just so glad I was able to put this in this show here at the Vern Rife. If you get a chance, you might like seeing it better in person. This in time piece is another one of those assembled pieces. It's, uh, I think it's 14 feet long in pieces, but it breaks out in the four sections and hangs over top of each other. It's actually at, um, at a lawyer's office here in, in town. And it's used, it's, when, they, when they got rid of a lot of Time Magazine books from the main library, um, one of those books was used as the main core of all those images on side it inside the faces, this, this Anthony is one of the kids and this another kid from Transit Arts who was um, getting in trouble all the time. But every now and again, these kids that get in trouble, if you put them in an art room, you'll find, if you just, just be quiet and leave them alone for a minute and start drawing or just, if you relax, they look at you and sometimes manifest the, their, their thoughts that they couldn't say when you try to say what's wrong. The biggest thing not to do to a kid that's, upset or out of focus to say is what's wrong just just be quiet sometimes they'll tell you what's wrong if you give them a chance to talk but if you start telling them and pushing them for answers it almost makes shuts down the process so it's like um i find the most inspiration out of these kids that seem to be really what we call bad kids or upset what you find is those bad kids or upset kids are like the wheel that squeaks that needs oil and the oil that of our life is so precious and so much like a salve, like a bomb, like a healing, when we know how to pull back and give that oil out. So that's, that piece is called In Time. It's got a lot of symbolism in there, a lot of memories, a lot of emotions. It's those kind of pieces, you gotta, you gotta be in a room quiet and study them. Virtuous Woman was one of the first images that I painted at the King Arts Complex when I sold a painting back in my early days. And it was symbolic of my mom. And uh, it was a, just a pretty girl I found in a magazine, but I used her image to talk about, my, symbolize my mother. Well, I suddenly realized that, that a lot of women are left to raise kids and they had this virtue of being mom, even when the father disappears or you know, I know it happens many ways, but this if this is to my mom, she still raised us. We were still we still knew her. She didn't totally abandon us, and so I, I understood that as a virtuous act. And and literally, um, the respectful woman it was always an honor. And uh, <laughs> on the right, you call American Doll. These are other women that were painted in my life, and you see the virtuous woman is tied up in there in another version of her. It's my, my little daughter's here somewhere, April, hidden inside of here, people from church, older women that are in our life, and even Monty, a lot of kids. This is what I'm, I think some of the girls in Columbus need to know about, because I think it's, it's, it's traveled to Cleveland. It's been a few places, but not really around. Okay, this is, um, this is what I really love to do, is 
I call this Larry's Larry's rhythm. This is Larry Winston Collins, and uh, he retired from Miami University. And um, he's the one that talked to me when he when I first met him. My my wife taught his daughter Laura at a school, and he saw my art on the wall in a room. He said I need to have shows, and then he um, he's the first person that introduced me to the Ebony Boys, and I got paid as a as a good artist teaching classes on Saturdays and started a whole trail of working with young kids. So this is kind of like a this is a story of Larry's life from what I experienced that was me and him in the younger days when I was a little looked a little different. And uh, it's like this, I think this is like uh, 30 years, 27, some years ago. And this PeaceWorks gallery was in existence then. Um, he had did he's he's done the cultural wall here in Columbus, if you've never seen that. Uh, he 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 does a lot of relief printing. He's he's taught a lot of people here. Uh, he's in uh, he's at CCAD, um, and he had a studio. He did and he did this piece right here. When I took some of the Ebony Boys to see him with these big sculptural pieces that would attribute to the homeless guys, and he has the kid imitating him here. So this piece was done for him, and I saw him at it says funeral here recently, and he told me he has this hanging in his bedroom wall, which is quite an honor to be in a place where you rest. This is uh, my sister, Penny, and um, she's always opening the door for more kids. And if someone said that they believe God's a barefoot woman, a black barefoot woman, <laughs> Penny was that, she was served that role, if you should know her. Ooh, stuff's emotional. <laughs> and when you get to this one, this is called a Bullets of Men. It was forced per perception. It's a, it's a room where my work was displayed at the King Arts Complex uh, in a show curated by David Butler. And so this, this room kind of says it all. This is where Dante Wood Spikes became the past brush guy. I purposefully used him. Most of these boxes are what I call uh, talking trees. They're cigar boxes transforming the people with words that flow from their insides or core. Um, the, the idea of the spigot in here is the, uh, the idea of more than enough coming to people, the resources of many black leaders. Uh, so under undercurrent in there is this idea there is real black leadership that may be ignored by the mainstream. And so subtly I was trying to, I was, I felt my need to speak for people that didn't know there is black leadership. So I'm answering the voices in my head. And that's what forcible perception, per, perceptions is. Okay, this is uh, another cool guy that the meets a street like Scott Woods. I never thought me and him would really get this close, but I feel like he's a, a true brother of mine. And people even think that's me looking at a different haircut sometimes, some of the kids at Whitehall. I got a chance to be his inaugural art show artist, and, and it was a really cool experience. I painted live when they performed at this place on Fifth Avenue, and it became one of the pieces for his gallery that wasn't even built yet. So I cherish the time I get to spend as a part of a streetlight artist, um, streetlight guild artist. And I hope you get a chance to check streetlight out and look for it. This is a big piece that was well, a piece that's done one of a one of the pieces done for Streetlight for Black Odes, it, and it was to um, paint a picture that didn't have uh, it didn't have any like slavery attached to it. It was just made from a place of family love, pure joy. And this is the I think this is a, the one of the three panels of the Black Backyard Cookout, and some of the people. These are all people from around my neighborhood. Um, the kids that were artists and it's he's wrote spoken word by it you can find black odes you can find uh words to it some of the words i can't even pronounce <laughs> because scott's got a vocabulary that just keeps coming so this is a big uh panel one of three that's been seen or shown there and i'm really down to the end of my whole journey here and thankful for the time i've got to spend with you um Hope you enjoyed the talk. This is a kid from these uh, that I painted from uh, Whitehall. He's in. He's he became the subject of the whole when we had the protest riots. My whole goal was not to paint people that were dead, uh, to paint the, the hope from where we were going. Our, the hope was to keep people alive and have kids that yeah, our future Melvin. I'm glad I wrote it down here because my mind went blank. I forgot Melvin's name for a moment, and it's it's so cool they did a whole protest book with GCAC and he's he's in the book in the pages and. Part of history and i think a lot of kids felt being painted on murals while they're alive to tell other people 
they're part of a movement to help us fight for, for justice. Dwart, that was so fantastic. Cool. Um, so folks, if you have questions, please pop them into the chat. Um, we're just gonna have a little Q&A session here. So the, the other thing to remember while we're on this slide, folks, uh, if you need more Dwart in your life, these are the spaces where you can find them. And most often anywhere at a cultural event here in Columbus, Dwart is everywhere. Um, it's, it's not an art party unless Dwart's there. So um, yeah, go ahead and pop your questions in there. And then Dwart, if you want to stop share and then you and I can chat. Yes. Red button. Okay. All right. And then I'm going to go ahead and add a spotlight. Okay. So, Dwight, you started early as an artist. You knew you were an artist from the get. Um, but you also work with so many uh, young folks who are either starting their journey or you know testing the waters with their creativity. Can you talk a little bit about one, um, how you knew when you were an artist and how you nurture that in young folks? Well, I think I think my mom and my brother Dar Lamont for that, the, my mother, they told me that um, that I would have to go to New York to be an artist. And my brother told me, and everything that's been made has already been done. And I was still, uh, I think, nine-ish then. But I kind of got quiet and looked at him. And I didn't say nothing. But later, like a couple of days later, and said, well, New York will come to me. And it was kind of like they, <laughs> I don't know why I'm so emotional this day when I'm talking about it. But it's like they, they put the fire under me. They really challenged me. So they made me kind of like, Knew, I knew that wherever I go, New York's going to come to me and whoever wanted to be, they had a chance to do whatever they wanted to do because it wasn't done through them. So it's like, and I understood, I just understood that every desire to create was a desire for humanity to touch and the idea of touching or that, that allows what we really need. That's this ball of yarn that unravels. So every piece of unraveling yarn ties us together. Wonderful. So um, we have quite a few folks complimenting you, which I told you would happen. Um, but let's pop into the next question. Um, can you share with us a day in the studio with Dort? Like, how do you start your time in the studio? What does that look like, feel like, smell like? It, give us a sense of it. If we were to, you know, you are experiencing your studio day, uh, individually but we're like a fly on the wall okay it would be like all right um if i'm so for me my studio's either in a classroom at whatever school i'm going to be at that day or it's in my yard when the sun's out there or it's at transit arts when it's out there or it's in my living room right there where i'm comfortable with the tv on and made space around everything so it it would be whatever is the deadline whatever, I sometimes when a deadline's there, I'll get up and do something that I want to do that, that isn't even on deadline to free me to go do a deadline. And I, I, I've i learned how to, instead of staying up late, go to bed, rest, and get up and work from rest. Working from rest is one of my best kept secrets or not really. Um, and I try to just do what I do and then show instead of talking about it first. I lose ideas when I talk. Uh, cause uh, I think sometimes it feels like my mind gets in conflict with someone telling me how to do. And I think it goes back to my mother and brother telling me what I couldn't do. So I had to, I, I think I fight in my mind not to be told what I can't do. And I'm consciously saying that as we're talking now, because I think the more we talk to someone, the more we navigate. And I really, really understand that art making art is not only the form of making art. It's the form of process thinking. It's the form of unfolding it's the form of, of of opening up and and unpacking and then then um so many realms of that so and it would be like i, I think I'm, I'm a very productive type person they say because i'm always doing something if i'm even even if i'm going to visit family i've got a bag full of things to cut or a bag full of things to merge together or i'm waiting to drive 
four things at once. And so it's like, and, and, and it's like suddenly I'm leaving, I'm leaving to go to school early in the morning. We ran over all these pine cones and they're flattened. And all of a sudden I said, oh, they look like angel wings. So I started collecting all these pine cones, really frustrated my wife because she doesn't want another thing in our house. And I said, well, I pay my daughter to work for me some money. So one of her things was to collect pine cones, but she didn't understand that I, I can't help it. I see it in my head. And it's like, um, when, she, when she sees it all done, she goes, oh, <laughs> but a lot of times if you catch us, now I'll say something, my wife and I, you'll catch us. It's like we're arguing, but that's the way we communicate. And, but we walk away doing what needs to be done and giving each other what we need. So you have to learn how to not always judge these books by these covers, because if you get to open the pages, you'll see a different story. <laughs> So I, I love what you were saying about um, how you use your art as a mode of communication. I think um, Katie Monahan and I were chatting about the work in this exhibition and that it so wonderfully uh, captures the idea of art as the at, the at its most fundamental is communication. And I see that in your work for sure. So we have a great question. Um, how would you describe your style as an artist? Do you create your own definition or feel that you play with different styles? So can you talk a little bit about your, I mean, you have a distinct style, right? So chat a bit about it. Uh, I, I, sometimes, so Jackie said I was a street artist and I didn't know it. And uh, someone said I was, a, um, I always say mixed media artist, and it's always room for uh, human figures. I don't even know what to really call it, to be honest. And um so I just I say mixed media and try to stay there, but it's always figurative and um, and it's it's texture, it's whatever you can find, uh, narrative, figurative, mixed media art, and and I want to try to put the word contemporary because it's now, like not just because and um, I, I like I, I, and it's full of color. It's it's so I don't know what to really say except those That's things. That's perfect. <laughs> That's perfect. So what I um, what I really appreciate about your work. Um, writ large is that there's a gesture in it, like there's a power in your gesture. Even when I see you make your work, there's such a command of whatever it is that you're using, whether it's a paintbrush or a collage piece, um, there's such confidence in your mark making and you see it in the work. Um, and what I also love about that is that when you give that conscious um, understanding of your worth within gesture, you then are passing that to the folks you're mentoring just in that visual. So can you talk a little bit about how you became comfortable in the gesture, in the mark making, in feeling secure in making those moments? It, when you said it triggers a whole lot of things. Um, there's people that come to play. It's a guy named Ryan that taught at Ohio Dominican. It's Joe Lombardo, who's full of color who paints portraits and landscapes. It's, um, oh my God, it's, it was, it was like, like living with my brother Darnell when I first moved to Ohio, you know, CCAD, there used to be houses like Buckeye Janitorial Service was living there. So I lived in a studio house there and across the street, there was another house and it actually was a murder there. And then we moved to that house before they were torn down. And um, I would sit around and I, all those grown up artists or, or high school, college kids. And I thought I was right with them because that was my New York era. And I literally would go to what they call the Pace Gallery. And I met Louise Nevelson and she painted these black boxes and she had this feeling. And um, so it's like when I painted these pictures, uh, I, I trusted some, somebody called air painting when you move or when you try to draw a line, you try to make it even. It never would be even. But then when you finally put it there, you have to put it there and let it go. So it was kind of this feeling of, uh, but it was like done with this. You know, if you can imagine Louise Nevelson or Picasso or anybody that Picasso did a lot of gesture of human figures. And but but Ryan told me that one guy paid this man to paint this fish. And he paid him a like a, a phenomenal amount of money. And he waited a long, long time. And the man said, I'm here for that fish that I asked you to, I paid you for, you never gave me. He walked to the closet, opened it up, and pulled all these fishes out. He took a marker and drew a fish, and he was done. And he said, you paid for all that training. 
So every line you make, every mark you make, everything you threw in the trash, everything that didn't look right, every piece of your desire to create is in those gestures. And you have to trust that your abundance, what comes out of you, is for the betterment of all of us. And so that's where the, 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 the thread ties us together. So it's like that gesture of yarn falling in an in a awkward place, the gesture of someone hurting you, picking them up, the gesture of someone dying and you crying at the funeral, the whole gesture of humanity is tied up into all that. So you can't regret any mistake. You can't regret any abandonment by your father. You can't regret any life that you didn't live. You just have to take the gesture that comes with life and go with it and then not apologize for not being able to be what you couldn't be. You can't apologize for someone dying or not being liked. So just love that moment. And the freedom from loving for a moment gives you the freedom to be free to gesture and let it all just roll right off your tongue or out of your mouth and out of your every place, out of the abundance of our life. Yes, to all of that. I think that that is a perfect space for us to end. Um, Duarte, thank you so much for the generosity of your talent and your time. Thank you for being a part of this exhibition. I think if anyone could uh, fully embody a beacon of light, it is you. Um, so thank you so much for all that you do, for all of the people that you touch. Um, like you, the, the ripple is wide for your impact and um, just really thankful. So thank you so much, Duarte. Um, and of course, uh, if you haven't seen the show, come and see it. It's worthwhile. Spend some time with Dwart's work, as wow. well as the other pieces in the exhibition. Thank you to all the other artists that are a part of this exhibition, of course, to Katie Monahan for curating it. Um, thank you to the governor of the legislature and the Ohio Arts Council's board for supporting the Ohio Arts Council, this great space. And of course, Ohio artists, thanks everyone and have a great day. <laughs>